does race still matter? Do we still need to be concerned about issues of racial justice and equality? It's been three years now since we've elected our nation's first African-American president. And plenty of academics, pundits, regular folk have commented on the significance of the Obama presidency in terms of racial progress. For some, the result is proof positive that racism and discrimination are things of the past. That there's really no need to talk about issues of race or racial justice anymore. The majority of Americans oppose discrimination and endorse a colorblind ideal where race is not supposed to matter. Many have proclaimed that we have entered a post-racial America. Others are a lot more skeptical, seeing the election and the Obama presidency as a continuation of more of the same. The perpetuation of some of the same power hierarchies with little reason to believe that much will change, at least not for those at the bottom. And there's every permutation in between, too. And indeed, there continues to be controversy within the black community, among black leaders, among even black celebrities, about whether we should still be talking about race in America, whether the president should or should not talk about race, whether there need or ought to be a black agenda in America or simply an American agenda in 2012. I'm not ashamed to say that I was moved to tears um, three years ago, November, on election night, as I learned that we had just elected Barack Obama President of the United States. For me, there were tears of pride, there were tears of joy, and tears of hope. Real hope for a better, more just, more kind world. I was drinking the Kool-Aid, without doubt. <laughs> Baby. I couldn't imagine, though, that moment when I was a college student, or even as a law student. And as I looked at my then, I had, my daughters were 10 and 11 years old at that time. As I looked at their faces, I just couldn't help but smile, knowing that for them, they were experiencing this experiencing this moment not just as something that was really cool, but also something that was normal. And among their first questions to me when Barack first announced his candidacy before he was elected was, Daddy, if Mr. Obama gets elected, can we have a play date in the White House? <laughs> and can we bring our dog? <laughs> as though there was nothing at all unusual about those questions. By the way, no, no play dates, no dog, <laughs> have met Bo. We have waved to him when he's driven through Kenwood and his entourage. <laughs> my daughter, too, my youngest daughter did, though, torment um, one of the dogs for Secret Service once when she thought it was kind of cute to fake like she was going to throw a ball to fetch down the street. I don't <laughs> think Secret Service appreciated it that much, though. I was also deeply moved um, by my city and um, its celebration on an international stage as my eyes were just moving through the truly diverse, joyful faces that filled Chicago's Grand Park, ironically the same park now occupied by Occupy Chicago. Um, or maybe not ironically. But as my faces moved through the crowd, I saw you know young, old, men, women, people of all ages, gay, straight, cross-section of America gathered together in the Chicago park at, the Chica at this historic moment. And in the background of that sea of faces, I, I admired also, I mean, it was beautiful, Chicago's vast lakefront, the city's breathtaking skyline that just seemed to contain, seemed to confirm that anything was possible. And so I'm gazing on this beautiful sea of faces, looking toward the large jumbotron, beaming the Obama family and um, our American flag. I took incredible pride in this, um, in this vision of my city. Lots and lots of Kool-Aid, baby. I was drinking. <laughs> and at the same time, um, on the west side of Chicago, in a black community tucked away 
from the cameras and out of the international limelight, neighbors also stepped outside on their porches and sidewalks to, um, to share this treasured moment. Barack Obama really was just elected president of the United States. I mean, dag. People cheered, um, embraced, shook their heads in amazement in Chicago's Austin community. My wife, Kenyatta, and I um, lived on the western edge of, um, of this neighborhood during the first five years of our marriage. Our first daughter was born there. I thought back when we lived there, and I thought back to um, the many children who would marvel me at me every day when I would come home from work in my business suit to walk our dog. I can't tell you how many times I was asked by kids who were not drawn to me but drawn by our dog, where is that coming from? You know, who died? Where was the funeral? In my answer, I'm coming from work never cease to puzzle the kids and draw sometimes some really funny looks. Male unemployment at that time was so high in Austin, the sight of an employed young man in a business suit was striking to the neighborhood kids. And I couldn't imagine, and I can't imagine, the excitement and wonder on those same kids' faces the night that on the election as they saw o the Obamas in a, a Chicago family on TV. But not everybody shared that excitement. Um, young Lennis Suggs in the Austin community, he was wearing an Obama t-shirt and he gathered just like everyone else with his friends to celebrate the victory. Um, when a white policeman stepped up to him among a group of fellow officers and just shot some pepper spray in his face, fuck Obama. This was just one of more this was one of more than 50 reported incidents of police brutality in Chicago's African-American Austin community on that night. Just one. I just want to stop. First, thank you for sharing the Chicago Best Ideas series. Um, as many of you know, but I haven't met a lot of you, um, I direct a civil rights clinic in the law school as part of Mandel Legal Aid Clinic. My students and I focus on issues of police accountability and service. We try on our better days to make the criminal justice system more fair. And when we're feeling really doggone ambitious, we take on issues of race, issues of gender, and class. Yeah, we do talk about race in our clinic. The project has, the clinic has <coughs> litigation, policy, community components, my students represent and provide legal services to people who are in need, who've been, who suffered abuse at the hands of the police. They bring civil rights cases and sometimes um, represent kids and adults in conjunction with the criminal and juvenile justice clinic um, accused of crimes. And while we've historically tended to work pretty, or tried to work pretty close to the ground, we also try to connect individual instances of abuse with broader issues. We ask the kind of how and why questions. Why and how did this occur? Does it connect or how might it connect to broader systems and structures? And we partner with community folk in, in, in self-help projects. Um, and as a clinical project, and those of you who experience the clinics, it's not just my clinic, students do everything. Um, from conducting a jury trial in a police brutality case, presenting a civil rights case before an appellate, or sometimes even, I guess the students won't go before the Supreme Court, but we've had cases. Um, to testify before a legislative committee to try to improve or change policy, to um, leading an, a Know Your Rights clinic. And honestly, I'm not sure how well my talk fits within Chicago's lofty Best Idea series. And it's scary, and, 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 and not even, humbling isn't the right word. Um, it's scary to even think about trying to live up to this moniker, to tr and I hesitate to hold out any kind of promise that I'm going to leave you today with this fresh, ingenious new idea that's never been thought before. Um, but I do hope to do something a little bit more modest. I realize, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, to share some of our observations and experiences and stories 
about race and about police that arose from our work on six, for over the course of about six years on the ground at Stateway Gardens, which is a recently demolished public, hi public housing high-rise community that made up about eight square blocks of Chicago's south side, just about 10 minutes from the law school. For lots of different reasons, um, our conversations about fundamental issues, conversations that shape the way we think, conversations that inform our policies, conversations that define who we are, tend to leave out voices from the ground. And so my primary thesis, if there's one idea that I'm pushing probably more than anything today, is that our conversations will be far more rich and our policies will be better informed and yes, more fair and more just when we seriously engage a view from the ground. And so drawing from this perspective, I'm going to explore with you whether and how race still matters. We'll touch upon some human rights concepts of impunity, denial, and how they interact with race in the context of a pattern of racialized abuse in Chicago. And I'll share a little bit, just a taste of a study that we did a couple years ago on this. Throughout our talk, and you're seeing now, and I'm sorry it took me a second to get it going, um, you'll see a series of photographs. And these photographs were take, are, come from Stateway Gardens. They were taken by Patricia Evans, um, which I hope will help ground the stories that I share and convey a sense of the vibrancy of this place that meant so much and still means so much to me and to a number of my former students. My students and I had the honor of representing Diane. She was a 50-year-old African-American woman, public school janitor, pa single parent, mother of three men in Stateway Gardens. Stateway Gardens, together with the Robert Taylor homes, which were immediately to the south of Stateway, constituted the largest concentration of public housing in the nation. One friend called it Chicago Soweto. In the course of our work with Diane and her neighbors, community members were, re were relocated as the high-rise buildings where families live were demolished as a part of what Chicago called its plan for transformation. And over the course of about a year, there were five Chicago police tactical officers who subjected Diane, our client, to a series of repeated assaults on her person, on her home, her family, and religion. This group of officers were widely known in the community as the Skullcap Crew. They forced Diane on two occasions to disrobe before them to bear the most private parts of her body. They threatened her with a loaded gun, with needle nose pliers, with a screwdriver, where she was convinced that they were fitting to rape or kill her. They beat and they choked her. They assaulted her with racist and sexist epithets of the worst kind. Tore up her home, desecrated re religious objects sacred to her, threatened to plant drugs on her, falsely arrest her and her teenage son. They beat her teenage son in front of her. They even brought then a middle-aged African-American neighbor to her home, to her apartment, and forced her teenage son to beat the older man for their amusement at the threat of arrest. Most of all, they did each and every one of these things. They committed each and every one of these sadistic acts with absolute confidence that, ain't nothing, that nothing was going to happen to them. Our investigation revealed, students' investigation revealed that these five officers had engaged in a years-long pattern of abusing African-American folks in public housing on the south side of Chicago. We heard multiple first-hand accounts of their abuse, stories of lining up young black men in a line and then kicking them in their testicles. St stories of ordering black men to beat African-American women at the threat of arrest, similar to what happened with their son. Forcing African-American women to take off their clothes while these officers ridiculed their bodies. 
planting illegal drugs on innocent people, stealing money from and at the same time protecting drug dealers. The list went on. But what would distinguish these officers most of all was their overt racism and the particular pleasure that they seemed to take in the racist acts. One resident reported, they get the jollies off of humiliating black folks. They seem to like get off on it. So how was this office, how were these, how was this group of officers, how were they able to target black public housing residents for abuse with the knowledge that nothing was going to happen to them? What underlying conditions were necessary? What underlying conditions allowed that to occur? We first meet Diane. That time, my students and I, a little background, we're engaged in a partnership at Stateway, um, public housing residents and writer Jamie Calvin, around a human rights documentation project. It was like a <coughs> documentation, self-help, and advocacy program where, again, we worked from the ground, literally. Um, in one of these buildings, um, we worked for about, for nearly most of the six years we were there at a unit in the ground floor of one of those buildings. It was residents had trashed out that apartment. Um, it was being used like as a dope house, and they trashed it out and converted it into working space for not just my students and I, but for other service providers too. And we became, for those years, de facto squatters at Stateway. Once literally the most densely populated neighborhood in Chicago. This is part of Chicago's historic black belt, teeming with migrants from the south, seeking work in nearby steel mills and the stockyards. The area occupied by Stateway was declared on the basis of the 1990 census to be the single poorest community in the nation. Official unemployment figures hovered around 90%. 90%. By then, the primary visible form of economic, the, mo the most visible form of economic activity at Stateway was conducted in the open um, drug trade. There was an open-air drug market. In public discourse and in our imagination, those high-rises on Stateway came to symbolize every urban ill, every urban danger, the innermost inner city. Late stages of this development of the demolition process, there was a billboard that stood on South State Street promoting what was called, or what's now called Park Boulevard. And that was the envisioned development to replace Stateway Gardens. And this billboard, it depicted a lovely montage of racially ambiguous photographic images of family, community. There's like a grandfather walking arm in arm with his granddaughter. Um, a little boy blowing a dried dandelion, strong parent um, lifting a little girl. And superimposed on these images were a series of words like family, dreams, life, diversity, laughter, hope, success. And four large words, though, stood out as the title um, of the billboard in all caps. Um, big font. A community coming soon. A community coming soon. I don't think that there were any malevolent intentions by the developers in promoting this truly beautiful communal vision, but I also couldn't help but wonder whether the city's architects have forgotten that a community already existed right here, as though the word community didn't apply to the generations of, fam generations of families who called Stateway their home. And this typified what my students experienced in I at the Ground. We experienced at Stateway over the course of those six years a different constitution a different constitution from that which we studied in our law school classrooms here, different constitution from which we experienced in Hyde Park. Inner city policies associated with the war on drugs, 
mass stop and frisks, street sweeps, street interrogation, sweeps of buildings, searches of residents' homes were daily realities at Stateway within those eight square blocks. And those routine extra constitutional practices created the context for grander human rights abuses committed by groups of officers like the Skullcap crew against people like Diane. Fieldhouse stood at the south tip of uh, Stateway Gardens. Indoor sign greeted everybody who came there. Welcome to Stateway Park. Welcome. There's no place like this place, so this much must be the place. And it was the place. It really was. The field house or the center, as is affectionately known throughout the community, was the place where people came together in this abandoned neighborhood undergoing transformation. This was the only public institution that provided a setting for common life. This was the place where adults and children played, where people gathered to talk politics, sports, love, life, where community meetings were held, the place just to relax, hang out, and sometimes just to be. As Stateway was dismantled, as the building by building came down, it was the place to where, with which, to the end, the community still remained visible to itself. Community center, typical day after school, you see all kinds of activity going on. You'll see a hundred or more children there, adults at the center, playing floor, ho floor hockey, assembling puzzles, lifting weights, participating in a dance program. It also served, and this was important, it served as a sanctuary of sorts from the conditions of public abandonment. It was a place where people felt safe, a place where everybody's welcome. No one's going to be hassled. Community and park staff made sure that's going to be the case. Kids, if they were members of street gangs or street organizations, they were BDs, GDs, everyone's welcome here. It didn't matter. You left that stuff at the door. Everybody knew the rules. This place is special. You don't mess with this place. It's also the place that held um, Stateway's Round Ball Classic, these annual basketball tournaments. Annual games grew out of like this decade-long tradition of organized nighttime basketball in Chicago. Many of you may be familiar with the received national acclaim for reducing violence, promoting community. Purpose basically get kids off the street engaged in constructive activity, stuff that builds self-esteem. And these tournaments had had a long, long history, a more than decade-long history of success at Stateway. Every winter, thousands, I mean, thousands of people would come through from the surrounding community, would come through these tournaments, and not just basketball fans, but they would meet at the center and enjoy what had become true community event. And some pretty doggone good basketball, too. My man Jackson grew up at, grew up at the center. Kind of, uh, he was known throughout the neighborhood as star basketball player when he was a young man. Not very tall, but he had moves that would make your head spin. Action, Action Jackson, everybody knew him. Kind of like the stuff of playground legends. He's well now, now at this point, he's well into his 40s, department store manager. He has nine and 10-year-old sons of his own. He still continues to play basketball at the center. He's the captain of what the neighbors friendly, jokingly dubbed as the OG team, the old guys team. Not original gangsters, old guys. <laughs> but make no mistake, they weren't any joke. These guys were good, they were defending champions. And Jackson's sons, Kareem and Jareem had um, just got out of school that day, cold February day, and they're excited because they're going to go see their daddy play. And the OGs are taking on these young guns, and everyone's going to say, how are these old men going to stand up against these 18-year-old guys? Um, Kareem and Jareem, they knew everyone's going to be there, their friends and their family. Whole neighborhood's excited to see what's going to happen here. Brenda. Um, she also knew that she and her family would be at the tournament that night. Like Jackson, Brenda grew up in the center. She took art classes, participated in dance shows, attended sports events like the tournaments. And now she's in her 20s, and she also has children of her own. 
Brenda's community life, though, still continued to revolve around the field house, the center. She was a fantastic dancer. I say was, Brenda passed. Um, she's since passed breast cancer, um, only 27. But every day Brenda volunteered there. She would teach kids dance. She would bring her kids. She would help out in the kitchen. She would do whatever she could at the center. And that same afternoon, she comes to the center with her then, like, one-year-old girl, Brishante. Um, and Brenda's teaching a dance class. Brishante's up on the stage, just like trying on these two big dance shoes, just pouncing around on the stage. Um, and after the tap, she and Brishante plan to meet her family and friends at the field house. I mean, at, to watch the tournaments, to stay there. And everybody did come out. Brenda and Jackson's families were among about 300 adults and children enjoying a typical night at the tournament when nearly 50 police officers descended on it. They suddenly entered the center. Um, they circled the field house, blocked each and every exit, and imprisoned Brenda, Brishante, Jackson, his sons, and everybody else there. Brenda's holding Brishante really close to her chest to protect her when two police officers come to her and order that she put Brishante down on the floor. One year old Brishante like looks up as she sees uniformed police officers grab her mom and then search her body. The little girl's eyes get even bigger as the police start rifling through her baby backpack and her diaper bag. The same officers then force Jen Brenda to stand by and watch as they search her baby girl from head to toe, even peering inside her pamper. And Brenda's powerless to do anything about this now. And over the next two hours, the police subject everybody there, from the babies, young children with their moms and parents, watching the game to the basketball players in their full uniforms, to invasive searches of their bodies and their stuff including Jackson and his sons, Kareem and Jareem. Police officers seize Jackson's gym bag, turn it upside down, throw the contents all over the floor. As Jackson stands near the sidelines in his team's dark green uniforms, <coughs> Kareem and Jareem are in the gym near the dad when two broad-shouldered male officers suddenly snatch Kareem and Jareem up by their collars, throw them up against the wall, tell them to spread their legs, and they search the boys like they're hardened criminals. What are you doing? They're just kids. Jackson's hollers. The officers release the boys. Kareem and Jareem see a police sergeant come and order their dad to put his hands behind their back, his back and announce to everybody at the gym that their dad is going to jail. Officers parade their dad out, still in his shorts and <coughs> uniform, outside in the cold, um, in handcuffs, everybody's seen. Cream and Dream start crying, not surprisingly, as their daddy's hauled off to jail. In the sergeant's message, everybody in that field house knew exactly what, the, what that message was. Nobody else is going to raise an objection to this search. Nobody else is going to raise an objection to that mass seizure. Jackson's the only person arrested that night during that raid. 50 officers left after they searched everybody. I'll never forget, and this was the thing that struck me, one, or lots of things struck me about this, but one of the things that really struck me was Brenda's reaction to all this. Her reaction to her one-year-old daughter being searched by police. And she told me, it was really matter-of-factly, she's like, it finally happened. <coughs> finally. <coughs> she finally got searched. It was bound to happen. Brenda thought this was normal. Her one-year-old baby finally searched by the police. A few years ago, um, one of my students as a part of a, a class she rode in the back seat of uh, like a ride along in the back seat of a Chicago police car. Um, she rode along with some officers as they for a few hours along their patrol. And um, 
My student, she was a white woman from a relatively privileged background. She'd been studying the Constitution, and she was amazed by a recurrent pattern that occurred while she was out on this ride along. Each time the officers would stop their car in a public housing community, every young black man would reflexively assume the position against the car. Again, hands on the car, legs spread to be searched. And the officers would oblige, frisking them, rifling through their coats, and the pattern repeated itself again and again as the officers stopped in different black neighborhoods. Similar to my reaction to Brenda, what shocked my student was that this was normal. It was normal both for the black men in the community and for the police. My student had been taught in her law school classrooms by people like me that the Constitution requires for that kind of stop and frisk that we have a reasonable belief that the particular person is armed and dangerous, that that person had committed a crime. But these weren't rogue officers. They were doing exactly what was expected of them by the department, and every young black man out there expected to be searched and treated with the suspicion of being criminal. At nearly the same time that my own daughters were experiencing as normal the election of our nation's first black president, Brenda and her neighbors know a different normal. They expect to be treated with suspicion, not by police, just by police, but by us, that they've learned to expect that they can be stopped and will be stopped and searched and treated like a criminal at any time. That's their normal. So I mean, a different constitution than what most of us know, at least. And I guess I want to be plain while I'm focused on stateway that these just aren't simply Chicago stories or stateway stories or African American stories, but these really are American stories that we all have to come to grips with. Many of you know that on any given day in America, nearly one third, nearly one third of black men in their 20s are under control of the criminal justice system meaning in prison, jail, on probation, or parole, one out of three. And although the rate of female incarceration is significantly lower, African American women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population in America. Our incarceration rates unparalleled anywhere in the world. 2.3 million people today in America wasting away in prison. 2.3 million people. And while African Americans make up less than 13% of our national population. Nearly one million of the folks in jail are black. In many major cities across the United States, more than 80% of young African American men have criminal records that subject them then to legalize discrimination in employment, housing, education, school loans, access to capital, public benefits, health care, in some states, even the right to vote. This mass incarceration of black folks fueled by, has been fueled by policies associated with our nation's so-called war on drugs, our failed war. And that war is, in practice, operated to, in all too many ways, as a war on black people. It's criminalized, I mean, it's criminalized a whole generation. In 1982, at the start of our drug war, there were about 320,000 people of all races in prison, in jail or prison in America. Today, nearly one million black folks alone. I mean, contemplate the enormity of, that, of those numbers, and I know these, for many of you, it's not the first time you've heard these numbers. That system of social control, when you think about this, uh, there are more black men in prison today than were enslaved in America in 1850. That's 10 years before the Civil War. What does that say about social control, about our social control of black bodies today, that we have more men caged in prison than enslaved during the height of slavery in America? We got more black folks in prison today than in apartheid South Africa 
apartheid, apartheid South Africa. Now, most of us probably believe that violence must have increased dramatically during that same period to explain this explosion of incarceration in America, and we'd be wrong. Violent crime actually decreased by 20% throughout the 90s and early 2000s and was relatively stable through most of the 80s. So violent crimes going down, number of black folk in prison skyrocketing. Not for murders or robberies, but usually for possession of small quantities of, of drugs. Indeed, three quarters of, according to DO Department of Justice data, three quarters of all new admissions in state prisons are for nonviolent offenses. Three quarters, 75%. Second myth, illegal drug use and sales must have exploded during this time frame, right? For their war on drugs. <coughs> in reality, and this is amazing, the rate of illegal drug use and sales had been going down at the point in which the war on drugs was declared. The rate of illegal drug use and sales were going down when the war on drugs were declared in 1982. And it continued to decline over the next de decade until about 1993, since drug rates have pretty much, drug use rates have pretty much stabilized. Third, what images do we see? What images come to mind? When we talk about drug crime, gang bangers, dope dealers, <coughs> crack babies, crack mothers, whose faces do you see when I say those words? What racial images are evoked? While most of us view the color of drug crime as black or brown, actual illegal drug use and sales rates. They might surprise you. Starting with the kids just because that's whom we most associate with gang bangers and drug dealers. According to a study done by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, white high school kids are seven times more likely than black kids to use cocaine. Eight times more likely than black kids to smoke crack. Seven times more likely to use heroin. 10 times more likely to use LSD, and there's even greater disparities with respect to marijuana. And get this, white kids are 34% more likely to sell drugs, illegal drugs, than African American kids. Yet nationwide, black youth are 48 times, 48 times more likely than white youth to go to prison for drugs. And if we look at adults, the picture isn't that much better. Although the majority of drug dealers and users are white, three quarters of all people in prison for drugs are black or Latino. In some states, like Illinois, African Americans make up about 90%, 90% of all drug admissions to prison. Now, is this what a post-racial world looks like? So I want to get back to some of the central questions, the how and why. Why do these stark racial inequalities exist? How does this mass incarceration of people of color relate to some of the conditions that allowed the Skullcap crew to abuse Diane and her neighbors for so long? How do Brenda and Jackson's stories that I shared and some of our experiences of a second constitution on the ground contribute? How might that contribute to our understanding of these conditions? As a young lawyer, or younger lore, still young. <laughs> I was struck by an observation made by um, the character played by Ice Cube in John Singleton's 91 movie, Boys in the Hood. It was right about the time I was getting, I'd just gotten out of law school. And Ice Cube said he played the character Doughboy. Either they don't know, or they don't show what's going on in the hood. Meaning, either they don't know, or they don't show, they don't care what's going on in the hood. this one, but um, we don't know. A couple of years ago, we um, conducted a study 
of uh, police supervisory disciplinary systems in Chicago. And our study taught us a bunch of things about the phenomenon of not knowing. Most urban police chiefs and um, public officials characterize issues of police abuse as one of a few bad apples. That the vast majority of officers do the right thing out there, but there's always going to be a few bad apples. You can't do that much about that. Our research, however, demonstrated that the problem, the abuse perpetrated by officers like the Skullcap crew, isn't simply one of a few bad apples, but it's that our broken supervisory disciplinary systems and these dual constitutions that we've discussed have allowed those bad apples, those few bad apples, to abuse people in certain communities with darn near impunity. I had some neat graphs with numbers, but I, I messed up that PowerPoint, so we'll stick with what we got. Um, but I'll, I'll state a few of them. Chicago police data showed that the odds were less than two in a thousand that a Chicago police officer would receive any meaningful discipline as a result of being charged with the abuse of a civilian. Less than two in a thousand. In a recent three-year period, so you're missing my numbers, but there were like a total of more than 10,000 charges of the most serious forms of civilian abuse investigated by the Chicago Police Department. Only 19 of those more than 10,000 cases of the most serious abuse resulted in meaningful discipline. Mayors and police chiefs are though right, at least in part, when they say that, well they're right when they say that a relatively small percentage of the force is responsible for the lion's share of abuse. The vast majority of the police force in Chicago isn't out there accumulating abuse complaints. Approximately 80% of the force, we learned, had three or fewer complaints of abuse throughout most of their entire careers in Chicago. The median number of complaints was about 1.5. Less than 5% of the department was responsible for nearly half of all abuse complaints in all of Chicago. And because, because most officers weren't com and aren't accumulating complaints, the potentially abusive officers just are super easy to identify. They just jump right off the page. You got 80% having a nice grab, getting no complaints, and a few percent getting all the complaints. The real problem, problem of not knowing is that the police department in Chicago exerted a great deal of effort not to know about patterns of police abuse in black and brown communities. Not to know about things that had the power and has the power to know about human rights abuses perpetrated by our own officers. Despite the ease of identifying these problems, I mean a repeater, someone with 11 or more complaints of the most serious abuse within a five year period, the most recent five years, could be 99.8% confident that no meaningful discipline would result if they're charged with abuse. 75% of these repeaters, the folks with the most abuse complaints in the department, never been disciplined in their entire careers, not even a slap on the wrist. Only about 13% of these repeaters had ever even been identified or flagged by any of the Chicago Police Department's so-called early warning systems. And indeed, there were officers, I mean, so 90% of some of the worst of the worst never even identified, never even flagged. There were officers who had amassed 50 50 or more complaints within the last five years, never disciplined, never flagged, never monitored. 50 or more. So-called bad apples even more easy to identify because police abuse is not just simply an individual phenomenon. The data show the obvious. Police abuse in groups. I mean, police officers, you work with a partner, you work for a particular sergeant on a particular team. And it's also even more importantly, not an equal opportunity phenomenon. It's not equally or randomly distributed throughout the city, but that Chicago police data showed that abuse is committed by certain officers, certain police units, and most importantly, against certain victims, lower income African American and Latinos in Chicago. Police abuse is concentrated in those communities, the sites of our drug war, the sites where we have these different rules and different constitution. When we analyzed police complaint 
abuse complaint data by groups of officers, certain groups just jumped off the page. You'd have, while well, most police units in middle or up, upper income neighborhoods in Chicago house maybe one or at most two repeaters in units of about 400 officers each, <coughs> nearly 20% of the Skullcap Crews unit, the officers who policed African Americans on Chicago's South Side in public housing. Nearly 20% of their unit were made up of these repeaters, officers who had amassed each 11 or more complaints within five years. So if you live in public housing in Chicago, I don't think you just see a few bad apples. These repeaters, when allowed to operate with impunity, can become a cruel and even corrupt face of law enforcement for an entire community. Take just for example our Skullcap crew who repeatedly abused Diane. There were 33 entire units, 33 entire police units, again made up of 400 officers or so each. They had fewer complaints among repeaters than these five officers did alone. The probability, if I just, we just picked out five officers at random, working officers in Chicago police force, that each would have amassed the number of complaints that these guys did, it was less than one in two billion. I mean, how blind. It really required a municipal commitment to machinery of denial not to know about the Skullcap crew. But not knowing it's not just about the mayor, it's not just about police chiefs and our public officials, I think is this goes back to what Ice Cube at least taught me. Many of us don't know what's going on in the hood. I mean, while it was normal for Brenda, it's normal for the young men for, at Stateway to be stopped, frisked, searched, treated like a criminal, it was shocking to many of the most educated law students in this nation. Most of us don't live in the hood. We don't know about the second constitution. And while everyone in Stateway, everybody knew about the Skullcap crew, everybody knew about them. Most of us simply don't know about the impunity with which certain groups of officers have been allowed to operate in inner city America. These stories aren't a part of the stock stories that we have in the lens through which we understand our world. And then back to Ice Cube, is it simply we don't know? I mean, in this age of information, it's difficult not to know that one in three black men, right, are currently under control of our criminal justice system. And with the ubiquity of cameras, YouTube, unlike the age of Rodney King, just 20 years ago where it was striking to, and, and it, it shook so many of us, um, to see this videotape beating across the nation. It's not that uncommon to see an incident of police abuse on the internet or even the evening news anymore. But a friend once told me there's knowing and then there's knowing. Do we really care? Because it's, while it's difficult it's difficult as a factual matter to, for us to deny that so many of our city's young black men are under control of the criminal justice system and branded criminals for life. We see these images on the news every night. We're nonetheless quick to deny that our policy of mass incarceration operates as a powerful system of social control. And we wrongfully assume that the maintenance of such a system would require some kind of conspiracy or evil discriminatory intent. And it just doesn't. It simply requires our inaction, acceptance of these realities as the unfortunate, if tragic, consequences of our effort to fight crime. It simply requires our indifference, a lack of care about those black and brown people who live in the hood. Late September, Stateway Gardens, getting dark. Pete steps out of his um, fifth floor apartment building to call in his daughter from the playground um, for dinner. Pete is a single man in his 40s. He secured sole custody of his then 10-year-old, she's an autistic daughter, a few years earlier after her mother died in a car accident in Memphis. So Pete's calling in his daughter from the porch. Plainclothes officer comes up from behind him, draws his gun, and approaches Pete. 
Or is Pete gunpoint, put your hands up against the metal grate fence that encloses his porch. Officers handcuff Pete behind his back. We're doing a drug investigation. We can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. And I can make it so you need Johnny Cochran. He didn't realize Johnny Cochran had passed. That's okay, I, I can't afford a lawyer. Officer Del Favaro then brings Pete downstairs to an outdoor hallway on the fourth floor of the projects. And Pete's attempts to let the officers know about his concern for the safety of his little girl falling on deaf ears. Del Favaro and his two partners then are searching the apartment of a clergy woman and her grandkids. And over the course of the next couple hours, they're towing Pete up and down in cuffs as they search the apartments of different folks who lived in the building. They imprisoned Pete outside um, one of his neighbor's apartment, a, a laborer who performed all kinds of odd jobs in the community. And these porches, it's, you've seen probably some of these pictures, they're open and everybody can see. It's just metal graded fence porch. And so as the police are going through the laborer's apartment, um, one of the officers finds this large plastic canister of roach spray, you know, like the kinds that, um, that pest professionals use. He sprays it out one of the windows toward some of the residents below, and they're just laughing. This is fun. And then another one's like, look what I found. And he shoots a white plume of foam from a fire extinguisher out, out another window. Marzano, the shortest of the three officers, he comes across a chainsaw in the hall closet, and he's like, this thing work? Pete's standing still outside the door. As Pete's standing outside the door in cuffs, and he's still thinking about, he still doesn't know what's up with his daughter. And it's long past dark now. Marzano, at the same point, is repeatedly kind of, he's repeatedly pulling the cord, trying to get the saw going. And after a few minutes, the saw finally starts. He then charges out the door with the saw toward Pete. and lifts the saw over behind the back of Pete's head, and then just guns the engine. What should I cut off next, man? What should I cut off next? Smoke filled the exhaust. Pete's terrified. I want a sergeant. I need a sergeant here. What the fuck's a sergeant going to do? Nothing is going to happen to us. We don't care. That's impunity. What's a sergeant going to do? The openness for everybody to see. This is on an open air porch. All these folks out here. We can do whatever we want here. Nobody cares about you. You're powerless. Less than human. Doesn't matter your father, your daddy. It doesn't matter. It's dark. It doesn't matter. You're worried about your daughter. It doesn't matter what we do to you. You're nothing but an end in the projects. Nothing is going to happen to us. Why were Marzano and his partners so confident that that was true? Why don't we care? We get to decide where war on drugs is waged. We get to decide what neighborhoods, who we choose to stop, who we choose to search, who's going to bear the cost. And remember, there's, not, there's at least as much, if not more, illegal drugs bought and sold in wealthy white suburbs than, and in college campuses here, than in poorer black communities. But as long as police abuse and math, mass arrest are concentrated in impoverished urban areas, as long as the cost of our drug war are borne by others, people of darker hues, who live in places that we know to be dangerous, public officials have little to fear about political backlash no matter how warlike or how aggressive our efforts might be. Is there a third reason for this mess? A third explanation for maintaining a second constitution in low-income black and brown neighborhoods? A third reason for mass incarceration beyond not knowing or maybe even not caring? Do we tolerate police abuse in the second constitution to maintain race and class hierarchies. Does police abuse serve a purpose? 
One final story, and I'll end with just a couple questions. A few winters ago, three months, it becomes de facto illegal to be black porn visible on South State Street in Chicago. Story had spread, at least among Chicago police officers who were assigned to enforce this policy, that then Mayor Daley was driven in his black limo down South State Street, and it was said that his sensibilities became offended when he saw all these poor black folk up and down the remaining two blocks of South State Street between 35th and 37th Streets, the area that the mayor had envisioned that new community coming soon. These poor black men and women outside weren't consistent with his vision for the future of the area, and how could they, city planners, attract developers, people of means to the streets when these streets are filled with poor black folks? How are we going to get that Target Superstore here? So the story went on that the mayor got red faced mad as our mayor was wont to do and rashly ordered the superintendent of police, you got to do something about this. You got to get these black folks off of South State Street. Now we'll never know if, for certain at least, whether this story is true or just the stuff of police gossip, but what we do know is that the highest levels of the city <coughs> put into effect a written policy that required Chicago police to maintain a 24-hour presence in those two blocks. That police command required officers to shag anyone in those two blocks off of South State Street and move them. And if people refused to move, they'd be arrested. During those first days of what the city called, it was called its State Street Coverage Initiative, it was like martial law was declared on two blocks of the South Side. In the dead of Chicago winter, their squad cars parked with blue lights flashing 24 hours a day, enveloping these two blocks. Other police cars cruising up and down the street. Numerous arrests were made. I know my students represented a number of the folks arrested in court. Squad cars, red lights flashing, blue lights flashing, blocking the entrance to the field house, the center. My friend Lloyd steps out of his apartment on State Street police car, three white men approach, roll up and them, don't you know, man, this ain't CHA anymore. This is white man's land now. To conclude with just a few questions, that these are the questions that arose from our view from the ground. What does systemic injustice in communities like Stateway Gardens What does that tell us about the state of justice in America? Why do we allow conditions of apartheid justice, the maintenance of two constitutions, to persist in 21st century America at the same time we have an African American president? Why do we maintain different constitutions in low income black and brown neighborhoods? How has our experience over these three years led by an African American president, how has that impacted our beliefs about race and crime? How has it affected our images of criminals, gangbangers, drug dealers? And what about our commitment to co color blindness? Does our ideal of color blindness blind us to the reality of racial injustice? What underlying conditions made possible the criminal careers of the Skullcap crew. How were those officers allowed to abuse with impunity black folks within eight square blocks of the south side of Chicago? Every single one of us here, we have a responsibility to have this conversation, to contribute to it. Stateway Gardens community is not here anymore. It's been raised. Make way for gentrification. Like the high rise buildings that once dominated South State Street, Diane and her neighbors, they're gone. They disappeared from that community. But the questions, the questions that came from the ground, the questions raised by Diane and her neighbors, they still remain. And they demand our critical attention. And that's what I'll leave you with. I'm happy to take a few. We only have a couple of minutes, but I'm happy to take a couple of questions if people have. Yes.
Um, so all these people that should be represented politically, right? Yeah. Uh, how, what sort of uh, influence do their political representatives on the city level sort of how can they affect this or can they fix this or how does that? So Chicago's broken Chicago's broken down into like all the different um, different wards as you, as, you, as you may know and so yes there's a um, there was and is a ward that and a city council person who then would rep be one of 50 who would represent um, folks um, I don't know that I have I, that I have a good uh, that I have a good answer, but what I what I can do, and this is you know the view that I'm tr that the view that I shared was despite that there is a politician who's elected and represented that ward and just like many other wards, lower income wards in the city, that these conditions persist, that for whatever reasons and for reasons at least I suggest that go beyond just the individual politician, but all of us more broadly about do we know, do we care, and what do we know about the conditions there? And all too often in our public conversations, I share a lot of the firsthand stories um, because these aren't stories that necessarily are part of these conversations as we're developing our policies, as we're having conversations and thinking about um, both issues of race and issues of fairness. Um, so in theory, what you say, it, it's right. There, there's a, there is someone who's elected from that community and in city council. Um, those conditions persist. Yes? Um. Uh, what type of uh, accountability did you guys um, like the clinic make for, for these police officers? I mean, obviously, it doesn't seem that there's a very high level accountability, but you know about what happened to Diane. Um, what, what was done? We fixed it all. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about this now. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, you know, so one of the frustrating, I mean, among the frustrating parts, so this project that I described with our students that lasted for a number of years wasn't designed or intended to be a litigation project in any way, shape, or form. It was, um, you know, designed as a community-based project to work with both police officers and um, members of the community to try to improve conditions of public safety and also address issues like accountability and abuse. And what we found, and this also goes to the question before you, what we found was, you know, when trying to engage in dialogue to meet together um, about what we can do to address issues of public safety, make people feel more safe, and also improve policing and police service in the area, that um, it tended to be a one-way conversation where um, command would engage community members but um, say, this is what we want you to do and this is what you need to do, um, but didn't want to hear stuff the other way around. So while we came um, and were engaged and we started with just simply documenting some of the abuses and fundamental conditions and, and, and trying to help people to know to make folks aware and not just about police abuse, it would be like we would photograph some of the horrific conditions under which people were forced to live with like leaking pipes and rodents and stuff and at the same time that officials were denying that there were any issues there. We would then plaster that ar around the web, and then lo and behold, like the next day, the head of the CHA would be out there with work, with camera crews and, and work folks in place, actually fixing stuff. So I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like a guerrilla-like, um, you know, human rights documentation project that um, sometimes had, you know, real immediate impacts like that. Um, but while it didn't start and nor intended to be litigation, we wound up bringing like five major civil rights cases. Um, and you know, I'd like to say that fixed everything. Um, and of course it didn't. Um, but some of the things that I'd say in, in terms of that, I, that, that, I, that I think my students 
really and truly did accomplish in addition to first and foremost helping real people who were hurt achieve some justice um, to, I mean, first and foremost, helping, providing, and working together with people who are abused and improving individual and family members' lives. Um, real concrete stories can tell and can share stories of Di where Diane is now, not in a perfect place versus she couldn't even speak to any of us shortly after this happened. I mean, I think it took more than a year before she could even begin to put words to what happened to her. So I think that's first and foremost important. But in terms of systemic reform, too, so some of the study and statistics that I shared. So one of the lawsuits then, um, and became a real galvanizing and organizing effort in Chicago, where this information, um, basic information that was kept underground, basic data that was kept um, about realities of police abuse in Chicago um, became public and became, and, and for about a year and a half, it dominated headlines in Chicago. It was what's talked about in, in public, in conversations, both on talk radio, black, white talk radio, um, to barber shops, beauty shops. My wife w went to a white beauty shop and they were talking about it there and she's like, man, you know, they're talking about that in that, just so that impacting even just as we're thinking about reform policies. And it, it led to some reforms and I mean so some of the things in the context like of those basketball tournaments. Um, there was a significant amount of money that then was put to creating some new community programs, reinvigorating the tournaments and improving some of the, some of the conditions. There was and, and has been now and I can't say this is complete success but some of this, and it's not solely as a result of stuff that my students did, but they were a part of, by exposing this, it led to organizing efforts that created um, a new agency within the city of Chicago to investigate police abuse called the Independent Police Review Authority. And again, now, I don't want to say, wow, that solved everything, because a lot of people will say that, and we're still, the jury's out, um, that some of the very same problems, the same fundamental problems that existed before continue to exist now because a pattern that we've seen and that we try to expose is that big scandal, huge scandal, right? And dominates headlines. People say you got to do stuff about it. Public officials say a lot of the right things. There'll be an investigation, no stone unturned. <coughs> and then people's heads, some people's heads roll. There may be even a new police chief, a new head of that agency. And then we all tend to, and the media too, and it makes sense to turn away. You gotta give these new folks a chance to see if what they're gonna do, is this gonna work? And public attention turns to other things. And then a few years later, we have a new, the next new big scandal. And the problem still being, the underlying problems of some of the fundamental conditions that allowed that abuse to occur with impunity haven't changed. I wanted to end on a more positive note but this, so here, the born, the born one positive note, because it's time, it's time to go, is um, I think the work that our students and the work that each of you can do makes a difference. I think it makes a real difference in individuals' lives. I think you can impact policy. You can impact a practice. And sometimes the work you do can help to change the course of human events. And there's nothing that even that's more fundamental. I mean, the proudest, I think, I've been involved in lots of big cases, quote unquote big cases throughout my career. Probably the case that I, and that I feel most proud about was working with a family to keep that one family together. And about three years ago, um, when this family, a man was charged with attempted murder falsely and um, trying to remove his, his then two, two year old son. A few years ago, I was called by, I got a call from him, just wanted to let me know that his son just graduated from college. You make a difference. Thanks.